Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Talking in Stations midweek update. For me, it is currently December 20th. For some of you, I'm sure it's December 21st. Um, today on the show, we have myself, Artemis Arbosa from the Capitalist Army, our Alliance the Network. We've also got Ron USMC. Say hello, Ron. Where are you from? Hello, uh, from Test, Dreaded in particular, but uh, yeah. All right on, and we also have Silver. Hey guys, Silver Suspiria XO for Fed Up. And a special guest for us today, we have Faulty7. Hello everyone, I'm Faulty from Tactical Supremacy. I'm also the Alliance Exec of Tactical Supremacy. What day is it for you right now, Faulty? It's currently Friday. It's got those weird days between US and AU. It's always fun to try and figure out who the fuck you're trying to... <laughs> so do you just like use Eve time all the time and get angry when people use local time? Or how does that work exactly? Pretty much. Yeah, we just use Eve time. Whenever whenever someone is like, oh, is that in, is, is that in local time? You, you just want to slap them because local time in Australia is... Because some of us have daylight savings, some of us don't, so it never makes sense to anyone anyway. Ah, gotcha. All right, well, let's get into the news that's been happening this week. First and foremost, well, not necessarily foremost, our Tri-Revenant has died. Uh, the Revenant being the Sancha Super Capital. Uh, it used to be massive news when they died, but more and more have been dying recently. We've gotten other faction Super Capitals into the game, so not as big news now. But it's interesting because it was seen moving through Molden Heath, and Tri has been continuing to lose members. They lost another corp recently. This takes the total up to five in recent memory, and they've also been continuing to lose Sav. Now, reportedly, their member or their leaders were AFK. They'd been deployed with the military, if I recall correctly, but now they're back, so we'll see if they start uh, regrouping. But they're still continuing to lose a lot of their solve in in Smother. They may have to retreat to Detrid in order to sort of regroup. We'll see what happens there, but we'll keep an eye on it and keep you informed. We've also got Signal Cartel, who are a fantastic group. Um, they've got a program. It's called Eve Scout Rescue Cash, or it's not just Rescue Cash. It's just Eve Scout Rescue. Because what these guys will do is, if you go into Spooky Space, you go into Wormhole Space and you get trapped, and you don't have a way out, they have two methods of helping you. One is they have rescue caches, where there's probes, there's scanners, things like that, anchored in a can that you can go and get, refit to, and then find your own way out. Or they can actually send someone into a wormhole to find you and get you a way out. And that is the thing that's called confirmed rescues, that they just completed their 500th just a few days ago. They're up to 506 with a live counter on their website. So congratulations to those guys. Massive thank you to those guys, because that is a huge lifesaver for the people trapped in these wormholes, often in expensive ships, maybe expensive pods, maybe they just don't want to lose whatever they're carrying in their cargo. Who knows, but massive shout-out to Eve Scout, massive shout-out to Signal Cartel for doing that. Do they charge for that? Is that just free? Is it it for is completely free. They do take donations, particularly with Eve mm -hmm. Scout, because they map their wormholes and things like that. So if you do donate, right. you can get like your picture pushed off on their website, things like that. But oh, cool. They're just it's like an a mountain awesome rescue group. team or something. Yeah, like call them and in comes the helicopter, right? Yeah, that's cool, man. That's great. Indeed. We've also got CCP just announced today, as of the time of recording, the details for the Eve World Tour. I love the little video they posted. It is, uh, it is amusing because hey, wherever you are, we will find you. It's, have you guys seen this, this video? <laughs> I haven't seen the video yet, no. It's good? I'll, uh, it is, it it is fantastic. Chat. I've got it playing right now for the people on stream, but the details, they announced what okay. cities they're going to. They've announced where as well. So we'll quickly go the rundown once this video stops playing. It's, it's amazing. So has anybody, have you guys started figuring out what meetups you're going to be going to this year? Toronto. Really? Yeah, I'm nice. going to Toronto and Vegas. Faulty, is it I'm safe to assume to you're going to uh, going to yeah. Eve down under? 
Yeah, I've been every single year. So this is gonna, I'm just going to keep the the role going. Can't can't miss one. But I, we also do like a bunch of stuff in pretty much every other city in um, Australia as well. So we usually do a bunch of those in between the main. Awesome. <laughs> You know, speaking of Eve Down Under, a few years ago, they used to give you guys very special skins. The Megatron Quaif one comes to mind because an Aussie friend of mine gave that to me. Do they still do that down? Uh, sometimes. I don't think they gave us one last, the light, latest one. I think we got, um, they started swapping the skins for the, um, the announce, like the special announcements. Like we got something specific for us, but that being oh. said, I never really paid attention to to the skins. I was mostly there just getting drunk. So, yeah, those skins are very expensive now. Yeah, I, I know a few people were logging in at the event to sell them as soon as they could because they were worth mm -hmm. a lot more then. Like it's it's always great when you see someone doing. So, running through the list of where we're going and when the Eve World Tour kicks off in March, March twenty third to the twenty fourth, it's going to be in Amsterdam, then it's going to be in Saint Petersburg on May fourth in sydney australia i'm assuming uh from may 23rd to the 26th then in toronto from june 21st to the 23rd a lot of summer meetups this year it's great fan fest home which is the the deal where they had people the video contest so people would go in and they'd present their home and ccp is going to have like perma band live from some dude's living room it's going to be fantastic <laughs> that's going to be on august 23rd then we're going to Berlin from September 13th to 14th, Las Vegas, as is tradition, from October 25th to the 27th, and finally London, rounding out the year on November 23rd. So look forward to those meets, look forward to coverage of them as well. It's always fun to see what CCP announces and what crazy shenanigans Eve nerds get up to. So also happening right now in EVE Online is Operation Permafrost. It's the new live event. And Ron, I think you have actually interacted with these mechanics. What's up with this? Yeah, you know, um, so I initially, you know, as always, whenever an event hits, I always want to get right out and uh, give it a shot. You know, it's, it's really interesting because what they did is they could have gone like the lazy way and just done, you know, the abyssal. But what they did is um, they did a, a reworking. It's, it's interesting. So there's a beacon out in space and you warp to the beacon. There's a couple of NPCs there. And then there are three gates. And each one of those gates, north, east, and south or west or something, and uh, each one of those gates, when you take it, it's just like a normal mission gate. And when you take that gate, you go to a big group of NPCs, and then there's something special uh, that you have to accomplish there. So it's it's fun because it, it kind of leans itself towards team play, which I think is is really fun you know, in an event because there's a lot of NPCs and you don't want to, you know, uh, as an example, one of the things is mining. Uh, I did see someone taking, you know, like a battle orca <laughs> through. Um, so that's interesting because, uh, you know, you need to be able to take all that damage, but you also need to be able to do the special thing. And the other one is hacking. Um, and you don't want to take, you know, like a little small explorer ship because there's just too many. NPCs, so it's so really Nester interesting. Finally, has a use. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. The this Nester is, is ex is excellent, and you know the other thing, you know, it's the kind of the typical, um, you know, counting up by the points, and you know, if you guys have seen the skins for them, they're they're gorgeous. They're you know white fading into the blue with the kind of ice crystal they're very cool there's like four skins and there's also you know a mod i think it's a missile damage mod or something it's not particularly crazy it's not like officer mod but uh it's very cool and it's i think uh, the special thing about skill. it is that it gives you in addition to the normal damage modifiers it also gives you a bonus to your missile velocity so if i recall correctly it's an eight percent bonus it. to missile explosion velocity so you're applying more damage but also applying it better to fast moving target yeah i got lots of guys putting up buy orders and asking for people to farm them for them it's a pretty neat mod 
and that's that's so cool you know like to add those interesting little things as well as the skins as well as the team play i think you know they put a lot of thought into this and it, re it really shows i mean I'm, I'm really happy with it i'm still running it it's a lot of fun uh you know, and I, I didn't even think of running the Nestor, but the Nestor would be perfect for this. I saw somebody, you know, running it with a Dami, and I just kind of like hooked up with him, like, hey, yeah, why don't you just go ahead? I'll just, uh, you know, orbit you and you take care of it. So, yeah, I've, I've been having a lot of fun with the event. So you recently, you pinged us in our, our sort of channel that we use to set up these sort of shows, and you're talking about some interesting quirky mechanics that have been found out about abusing the new war deck changes that went live and was it december 11th patch that they went live somebody help me out a recent patch anyway where now the yeah. mechanics are you can only declare a war and you can only have a declare or a war declared against you if you have a structure anchored in space and if that structure is gone if it's destroyed or unanchored then the war deck is immediately invalidated. And apparently people are using this to let their high sec trade hubs survive longer than you otherwise would. How does this work, Ron? So first off, I'm gonna, you know, just cap give a caveat and say that, you know, I said that when the war deck mechanics came out, if you just throw it over to the high set guys, they're going to figure out a way to get around it. Um, they are, you know, mechanic experts. And there's a couple of different ways um, that people are using it now. So the first one is the really obvious one, which is um, they anchor a POS, then, you know, declare war, and then unanchor the POS. Now, what happens is then you get a 24-hour cooldown as because it immediately ends the war, and you get a cooldown, and during that cooldown, you can't be war decked, right? That's one. The other is, and I don't even I don't even understand the 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 minutia of it, but basically it's a corporation that is part of an alliance that there's a war deck on. And then that corporation leaves the alliance that cancels the war. Then they have a 24 hour, uh, you know, another kind of cool down. And then, then they plant a structure. And for that 24 hours, you know, they can, you know, get a freedom, get, you know, freedom of uh, absence of war decks. Right. So, the, the the nuance is if you drop a market structure, uh, you know, in JITA, in perimeter, you have a 30-minute window basically to declare war on them because 24 hours later, it's going to anchor. And if you can't, if you have declared war on them and you can kill that during that uh, anchor before it completely repairs and it anchors, you can kill it instantly before they can put rigs in it, before they can do anything. So it's all about a way to get that 24 hours plus, you know, of not being able, of being invulnerable basically to war deck. So, and there's all kinds of little nuances about, you know, declaring war and then uh, trying to, and then joining an alliance and then that, you know, cancels the war and then oh, surrender mechanics and it's, and you can chain it's, it's, all these together or people like chaining them together to be like forever invulnerable like that? Well, so, you know, the key is if they can get the market structure down and if they have that 30 minutes, basically, that the structure starts to repair and then it onlines – they have from then until, you know, a day or two to keep a market up, right? Um, because, you know, so TEST has the Tranquility Trading Tower. So everyone is trying to undercut that, you know, the 0.3% or whatever it is. Everyone's trying to undercut that. And it, if they can get one or two days, that, you know, pays a decent amount. So they just are trying to figure out different ways of getting, 
you know, that invulnerability during that initial timer, because then we have to go through the entire timer cycle. Interesting. It, 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 it's leave it know. to Eve players, right? To gain everything, huh? <laughs> dude. Leave it to high sec, man. Around the aggression mechanics and the high, like it's just crazy, dude. It's crazy. It's it's been a lot of fun. Um, I, you know, we always kind of joke that we didn't sign up for this, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's been a, a learning experience for a lot of us, and I'm sure they'll be tweaked, uh, you know, as we go down the uh, path of them kind of looking again at the war decks and how people are using them and how many structures are getting up. So it's it's interesting though. Yeah, I it's think it's to be turned there. It's a credit to the the member base of tests that you guys are able to continue to. I always said when you guys took over this market, killing off the existing market is not the hard part. The hard part is maintenance. It's keeping those other markets that will constantly be springing up trying to take your market share. It's making sure that those guys die and die quickly. Because every second they're up, they're stealing money from you. And it's really a testament right. to the Test Alliance leadership and membership that you guys are able to not only manage that, even with these wonky mechanics, but you're also still actively involved in NullSec Warfare, in fact, involved in a couple of massive fights that we just had over the last few days. And Ron, you were involved in some of these. Can you give us sort of the frontline view? What was it like in these fights? What were they over? What happened? Yeah, so first off, I just, I really respect what NC and Pandemic Horde, what they're all doing. I really respect that because, um, you know, what we did is we sat in, um, we call it Ouija board or Ouijanin or whatever you want to call it. It's like seven jumps out of Cheetah. And we put up a staging fort there. Uh, we put up several. And they, I guess about a week and a half ago, have just decided that they are going to take these staging forts out uh, you know, blood and fire and dragons or whatever it takes to root us out. You know, <laughs> they got to get rid of the dinosaur menace. And what they've done is great in the sense that they are escalating. They're escalating big. They're dropping the hammer. And that, you know, to to us, that's awesome. Like, bring it. Because, you know, we're used to that. We like that. Um, and if you are serious about it, then do it. Drop 80 Titans. And that's what they did. I think it was Sunday. Um, and that so basically we have three staging forts. And they hit the first one. We didn't really think much about it. But then they were forming, you know, big for this second one. So we formed as well. Massive fight. And, you know, I didn't realize going into it. Oh, no, this was Monday. I didn't realize going into it, but that was a six-hour tie-dye fight. We were there for six hours. Carriers, they dropped whatever it was, 60 to 80 Titans, you know, uh, an equal or more amount of supers. It was just insane. And, you know, basically we won the subcap fight, but then, uh, you know, they realized, hey, you know, you can't have bubbles in low sec. So they don't even need the subcaps. So they just sat up there and just pounded because we couldn't stop the Titans. Like we just couldn't stop them. So uh, then they sent that one into the next timer. Well, let's hit the second one. So then they hit the second one, <laughs> you know, it, it, then that's a big fight again, not quite as big. And then, Today, uh, you know, um, you know, <laughs> hanging out, and then I we start getting rage pings, and basically they were hitting the third, um, the third fort today, and they were, but they were just hitting the first timer, right? So they only dropped three or four dreads, right? You know, come on, you know, respect us, <laughs> show up in force. Or stay at home, baby. We got we got other stuff we got to do. It's a weekday. Come on, baby. Let's let's kick it up a notch. So what they did was, uh, so then we sent out a little bit. 
baited out some more, baited out some more, and then it was just a full-blown escalation. And <clears throat> here we come uh, with some Titans, or they came with Titans, they came with Supers, and we just said, you know what? All right, so let's do this. So we dropped Titans, we dropped Supers, and you know we just started shooting each other. Had a great time. Um, I think the final total was we lost 11 billion and they did uh, reinforce our third fort and they lost 75 billion because I don't know what it is about, but they just always leave their faxes on grid. I don't know why. So we killed all their faxes and then uh, we got uh, one of their supers there at the end and another super escaped. And I tell you, Hats off to that guy because that must have been nerve wracking to because he disconnected and he came back and um, all these little, you know, interceptors are pointing him. And uh, but then he jumps out like and I was like, oh, man, that is so odd. What a great story. You know, good for him. Uh, yeah, but that was the second. Not not so lucky. <laughs> that was Tiberius. the worst feeling of warping back in after a dc right and then you land on grid and they're still there and you're like oh no and you spam and jump right that's cool that was tiberius One of our Stargazer, guys did the same. who um yep. was the nc pilot whose super was the one that you were just describing and he was actually in talking in stations discord today describing how oh. it felt to do that so you guys can go and read what he had to say about it in the public channel of the talking in stations discord so that was fantastic but not only cheers to him have nice we had thing. Ron and Test fighting in perimeter, constantly trying to take these citadels down. Then we've got them fighting alongside Goon Swarm Federation, all their SIGs, against NC, PL, Horde, etc. We've also got fights going down, as you do, in Cloud Ring and Pure Blind. And how is this going on, Silver? We've been talking about this for it feels like a month now. Where you just guys are constantly having fight after fight after fight. What is happening now? It's only continuing to escalate. I feel like every night uh, is something else, uh, and it keeps getting bigger. Um, the other night when uh, in Cloud Ring, the, the the general conflict is kind of stalemated at this point. With the so as far as Sov goes, you know we we pretty much have Sov timers on either side of the fence every night. Um, neither side's been able to make much headway there. Um, you know, our drawn friends have been able to take down a couple of structures, and that and that's basically because our uh, FedUp's pilot to capital ratio is still pretty low. We're still a pretty young alliance. We are faction warfare based. We're nubro friendly. You know, our capital numbers just aren't developed yet. So we have a disadvantage because, you know, Ardra is a little more seasoned. Um, they have support from smaller snuff groups during the U.S. time zone if they need it. They have tissue who's been coming around and they're all caps, you know. Um, so we've been losing structures a little bit uh, because of that. So, you know, we set up a little trap, um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Ardra's favorite tactic to start an escalation on a, on a structure is to put one rev there, an active rep rev, start shooting a thing, right? Drop a fax if needed. Maybe they throw a little small uh, subcap gang and then hope that we – well, at, at that point, we have to escalate with caps for the most part, right? So, you know, we decided, well, we'll use cruise torp uh, phoenixes. You know, to shoot the siege dread uh, on the on the fort, and we'll drop a Sino and Hib, and we'll put a bunch of faxes there, and hopefully keep the Sino Hib alive. Um, so we made that what it looked like. Uh, the, they then deployed caps, they dropped them uh, carriers at range, and then warped in on top of the Sino and Hib. We blapped the Sino and Hib and sprung a little trap. You know, Nulsec. I'm not really good with that name. NSH. Nulsech, 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 For the record, those guys, there's <laughs> yeah. also a group of super hunters. They're Russian. They're called Loshech, Slopin. Completely unrelated. <laughs> it happens all the time. People confuse oh, the two groups. Nulsech, and Loshech, completely unrelated. Uh, the network is actually good friends, my alliance, good friends with Nulsech, Great group of dudes, but they are not related to the Russians. Just putting gotcha. that up. Gotcha. So Silver, well, is this all yeah. for Sov? Is this, are you guys, you know, like putting down iHubs and are they taking them? Because, I mean, you know, like we're just uh, kind of talking about it like it was a fight, but that thing was massive. You know, that was 
Monday, and you know, and I was actually, you know, uh, talking about we were talking about this the other day, and I was, you know, in a six hour tie dye fight. And, you know, I come out of the six hour tie dye fight and I'm like, you know, little princess, like, oh, hey, I was in a big fight today. And then I look at the kill boards and the fight you were in dwarfs everything that happened. So yeah. is and, that solve yeah. and baiting? And Yeah. So we, we've been having this solve fight with with Penn is out, um, you know, it, Penn is out and, and, and fed up or former allies. Uh, Penn is out when they left factual warfare, sort of reset everybody, um, which is pretty needed. We were struggling to find content in U.S. time zone, right? So now the fact that we could shoot each other uh, has just shot the content through the roof, right? So yeah, we're kind of trading back and forth Sav um, and structures in our, in each. We live right next door to each other in Cloud Ring. Um, so it's a little bit of we bait, they bait. Um, and then this is the biggest fight we've had so far. And it just turned into a massive cap escalation where people would die, reship, jump back in, die, reship, jump back in, die. I had one guy that lost three dreads in a, in a fax, <laughs> one guy. Um, oh, wow. and so it was like 125 like versus 150 billion. Yeah. Or something like yeah, that. Yeah. About that. Yeah, Jeez. so fairly close. I mean, I think really we edged them on the ISK more because there were some blingy pods in there, and they tend to fit their caps a little bit more bling. I mean, there was a couple of like four or five billion ISK Moroses in there. Um, but it was a really entertaining brawl watching people just die and come back and die and come back and just could just duped it out at zero, you know. Um, yeah, it was very it was very entertaining. I, I think both sides enjoyed it. Go ahead. Out of curiosity, has anybody used Celestuses or Molluses against you yet, Silver? Uh, not not in okay. general. It's something we normally put our new rows in. Well, because but... you mentioned that you guys use the strategy of you take the, the Phoenixes at like 250, 300 kilometers away from a Fortizar. That way you're outside of the range of its weapons, but then you can also, the cruises have enough range. But the problem is with that, even though the siege module, you're resistant to damps, you're not immune. And so what I've actually done, we did prepared for it, defending the NTAC-6, the home system, my corp, is when people come in with those, a single mollus, like a single 1 millionist mollus damping that phoenix, the phoenix can't lock the Fortizar anymore, and your Fortizar is safe. So I was wondering like, if yeah. people had been doing this to you yet, and so it escalates subcap-wise, or if they're just going straight, forget it, we're throwing our capitals out there and get it done. Yeah, uh, in interestingly enough, that that strategy is more Iron Armada's thing. Uh, they call them Coast Guards, and it's sort of their answer to um, being out escalated slightly, right? Because you could um, get the get a cap roll to commit at one spot, and then bring in your phoenixes at another spot and shoot the caps. That's what it's really for. Um, and then you put a couple faxes up there to try to keep the sign on hip down, and then do what you can. Um, actually they hope to actually get a bounce. So you start to, you know, float off a little bit and then fire. Um, cool. so that that's iron irons, uh, strategy for a lot of things. Um, but we knew that we had used the strategy against pen is out before. Um, so we kind of knew that they would have an answer for it next time. And we use that to sort of, uh, bait them into it. Not, not, it wasn't a, a, a bad trap in my opinion. I think they're a little upset. Because, well, NSH has been looking to get involved in the Cloud Ring conflict on one side or the other for a couple of weeks now. And they've been asking both sides. And we've both been kind of holding off, like, because, you know, we we want to respect each other as much as we can because it's been really great. Um, but since they've had the edge on the caps on us a little bit, we finally gave in a little bit and decided to see what would spark off. And what happened was way more than what we expected. It just ignited into a massive cap roll. That's one of those things with the localized content. Uh conflicts as well is you know it's all well and good while everyone local is fighting and you've got those sort of relatively even numbers but those as soon as someone has that one big bat phone it sort of throws all bets are off and then everyone just goes for it and it turns into fucking giant tie-dye fights because every man and their dog is called from one side to the next and it just completely snowballs yeah and that's sort of what happened in the next fight we'll talk about in pure blind right so we had this big cab fight um, the day before, um, Black Legion was up in Pure Blind. So now Fed Up lives in two places in Nullsec, right? We were originally living in Cloud Ring, um, and then post the Northern War, when everything got burned out, um, we decided to move a little bit north into Pure Blind. It's a little bit better, better pocket for us. Uh, True Sex a little bit better. There's better moons up there. This is in general better. 
So we moved our staging up into Pure Blind. That's where we really live. And Cloud Ring has just been a content ring um, for them. But during this conflict with our draw, Black Legion shows up out of nowhere. And I'm not really sure why Fed Up keeps finding itself at the center of these like massive U.S. time zone content. But uh, you know, Elo came around and reinforced our iHub and our staging system. So the day before the cat brawl, he came down. We defended the Sav pretty well, but he had the numbers. It was really late at night, and we were tired. We already went through a Sav fight that night, and he RF'd our staging fort. So we had this big cat brawl. The day after it was the armor timer for our staging fort. Now, we don't like, like Jesse said, we, we don't want to get into a bat phone war with anybody because then everybody and their mother shows up, and then you know we all often become insignificant then. We just watch the two big boys fight in the same system. Um, but it, we, we felt like we didn't have a choice here because again, we don't have the cap numbers that these other people have. We don't have supers. I can be, I'll be honest with you. I think we have like three supers and they're never going to see combat. And, and, you know, so we felt we had to at least inform the Imperium that this was happening because if we, if that armor timer had gone down and we lost our market there, then our war and cloud rings over because that's where our staging is. We'd have, or at least we'd have to spend all night like shipping it to another fort or standing back up the market. So we told goons, and you know what happens when that happens? You know, everybody catches wind of it. Everybody sees each other forming. Um, so the U.S. time zone uh, goon guys showed up in way more than we expected. A huge Valtech fleet of several hundred pilots. Um, Pen is out and Snuff and Tissue on one side informed me earlier in the day that we would they would come down. As a third party, um, they would probably preferably shoot Black Legion, but everybody was fair game. So if nothing popped off, you know, they could shoot us. Um, and then, of course, you have Black Legion, Pandemic Core gets involved, Pandemic Legion gets involved, you know. So we wound up in this situation where also we have snuff uh, structures in our staging in D2 from a couple of weeks ago that they put there because I don't know. I um, mean, we've been trying to kill those, but every time we get it into Hull, they drop 17 Titans and game over, right? Um, so Pet is out and Snuff sign in on their Astra, which is in on grid with our fort behind the dock, right? In front of the dock is the gate. Black Legion, Pandemic Legion is sitting there with us on the fort. So we got a triple standoff going on because I imagine when Black Legion jumped in, they must have thought we phoned goons and Snuff because we weren't shooting each other. We were just staring at each other. So we had this awkward, like, 10 minutes of staring at each other, poking each other in, in private messages, like, yo, what's your deal? What are you here for? During that time, my fort repaired, so win, right? Um, and then all of a wait sudden, a minute, wait everybody... A minute. You're telling <laughs> me that the fort, the reason for this fight, the fort repairs, and then you guys fight Without it out anywhere. Fire. Right. What? Because what you know what happens, right? So so we didn't know, you know, when you got four hundred Baltex sitting on a on a fort and I well formed, I had about eighty Nagas, right, sitting there. Um, and tissue and and snuff sitting behind me, not shooting. So everybody's like, Well, wait a minute, who's shooting who? Am I gonna get, you know, jumped on here? So they were trying to figure it out, the fort repaired. So I was like, <laughs> All right, but we were all dressed up. On relatively cheap ships, you know, ball techs are relatively disposable. Nagas, forget it, I could throw away those. Black Legion was immunins, and the only thing worth anything was the tissue and, and uh, stuff, pen is out fleet and carriers. Um, so all of a sudden, everybody lunged towards uh, the, the carrier fleet of tissue, snuff, pen is out, and this tie dye brawl occurs on the Astra house that they're sitting on. I give them a lot of credit for dropping tether and taking the fight because there was a lot of people on that grid and they held amazingly well. I think they lost like one carrier and two facts before everybody backed off. Um, and then, you know, several skirmishes broke out all over the grid after that. I think there was a Goku fleet from pandemic Legion shooting tissue. And when they realized they couldn't break anything, they turned around and jumped straight towards my Nagas. And we had a little fight there. It was like, really interesting mix of like frenemies and who was there to do what. And we were all dressed up and wanted to fight. So we fought and the objective that was the catalyst for all of it had nothing to do with it. So we've got lots of content happening in Geminate around the EU TZ, lots of content happening in cloud ring, pure blind USTZ and now faulty. 
Rumor has it you guys are starting some content down in Providence area in the AUTZ. What's going on? Like, what is happening? It's it's actually a mix between AU and US, surprisingly. But uh, for, give some backstory. We we've held an uh, back back when Legacy did the station grab in Providence. Tickle kind of had our own thing going on as well. We helped with the station grab. We waited for the stations to be pretty much done, and then we started fighting Providence themselves because Provi at the time were AU tanking everything. So they had all their stuff set for AU times, and even though they're pretty much a non-existent AU entity because that was the quickest way for them to defend against PA. So we took advantage of that and went and reinforced a whole heap of uh, citadels in a constellation that's in direct range of our home system. We also took the opportunity to put an iHub down in the highest secure, uh, sorry, highest true sex system of Providence as like a kind of fuck you because we can, and uh, as, as sort of like a future content proof thing. And um, it's kind of escalated from there. Before all of that, we had a content Astra House there, which we were killing. Like I think we killed like a cat fleet and about 50 bill worth of stuff on just a random Astra. Then we dropped a Fortizar, which escalated even further. Providence have been calling Siege Green to help them, and that's kind of not gone well for them. We ended up murdering a faction battleship fleet worth like another 50 bill or something like that. So it's just, we, we just sort of put some structures down and they just sort of keep coming up to us and, and fighting us. It's it's more just content, like we're just doing it for fun. And there's this whole like Reddit thing going on where we're actually invading apparently and we just sort of stoke the fire a little bit. But I mean, we've told them a million times we're just there for fun, but no one ever believes us. Nah, the old Eve invasion always starts with, we're just there for content, man, we're just for fun. Hey, man, I don't want any more space. I don't need it. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's already it's, annoying defending one <laughs> you know it's funny um you know like uh, the graphic that's uh, um you know it, i always see the things on reddit and you know it it's i always feel like it, it's like people tattletaling on each other if that makes sense to try to get big brother involved you know and it's like oh hey so and so's doing this what do you think about that test and you know and, and like i'm like uh like we're, we're, what like and then it's like oh so and so's doing this what do you think about that frat like oh you know I, so I'm always a little confused in the sense that you guys are just there for fights and you're just having fun, but where is that kind of weird? Is, are, are the allegiances down there really like you guys just kind of team up for fights and it's not like a big deal. People just like to make it a big deal because I don't see like huge escalations. I see like lots of, little scraps and you know and, and kind of sob going back and forth yeah, but that, that... that sort of that huge escalation thing that's a very point of view thing so to right. to test and to like legacy you know we're like oh you know that's 50 titans 50 supers that's a bit of a decent that's like a pretty big escalation to groups who aren't used to seeing that kind of stuff you know eight to ten supers and a couple of titans landing on grid is probably like huge escalation oh my god Right. From Provi's point of view, they probably think that we're bringing the absolute full force of, you know, whatever everything that we have to come to bear on them. Oh, but we're probably, I so, see. And realistically speaking, within Providence, it's like, it's an interesting sort of, I don't know, diplomatic thing. Like, I, I even posted this on one of the Reddit threads when they were calling us out for being allied to HTP, because HTP, for those who don't know, live in Amalosek and a little bit in Provi, and they, uh, they basically farm Providence for content as much as they can using caps and supers to leverage numbers versus, you know, uh, skill essentially, I guess, or the ability to bring that kind of stuff to bear. So we work with them because they've messaged us a bunch of times and be like, hey, we know Providence is going to have some stuff here. Do you want to come? And we're like, sure, like it's something to shoot. Now, the funniest thing about this is way back when we were doing the uh, station grab, Providence, um, we were all in a command channel together with Providence. Like we were, taught, we were coordinating with them and trying to like work on uh, fighting PL. I said to them, you've got stuff in AU time zone. I will defend your stuff when PL drops Titans and Supers. Not a single message. Didn't get anyone to say, come help us. Nothing happened. So we're just like, all right, I guess they didn't want us to help them kill. Um, so then fast forward, HTP are like, hey, Providence are here. So we go and help them. And then Providence is like, wait, well, ha why are you doing this? Like, <laughs> this is clearly some coordinated effort to destroy us. But it's like, oh, no, right. we got a ping. Like, that's all. And the funniest part of that even is Providence is set neutral to tickle. HTP and all their friends are technically red and orange. So we consider them to be more of a like enemy to us than we do Provi. We just work with them at times of convenience. So there's never like, 
it's never some giant conspiracy in some smoke filled back room or anything like that. It's like literally a ping goes out and they're like, okay, sh-. and 90% of the time, HTTP turn up to the timers in our system, which is PI5, because their spies are in the fleet. So they know something's happening. So they just turn up and say, hey, we're here to help you. And then they message us saying, they're going to do this thing to you. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's been entertaining because, you know, some of the Reddit drama is hilarious. And I mean, it's, it's it's always one of those interesting things, and like I was saying, it's all it's all about perspective earlier on. That you know, Providence probably thinks we're bringing everything to bear, but I mean, realistically speaking, we fought them yesterday in in U.S. time zone. It was like literally six to seven o'clock in the morning for the Australians. We had a bunch of us, and they brought a Macarial fleet, and one of our Aussie guys was half asleep, boasting their fleet, and that was the end of the fight. So it was like, there, there was a meme going around that it was like. Um, Probably in your prime time versus one tired AUTZ boy or something like that. But, <laughs> oh, that's great. So, I mean, it's just a matter of it's it's turned into a situation where it's somehow escalated into something we never expected it to. We just keep sort of rubbing our hands together going, this is great. Like, why would we push any further when we can centralize everything around one system? That's easy. It's in range of our home staging. We have a jump bridge directly to it. We have a Sino beacon there. We have a Fortisar there. There is no reason for us to push any further. And we're just sort of holding, we're, we're in a holding pattern about this system getting contact. Well, it's and interesting been... you mentioned the, the Titan thing, because realistically, what can probably do about that one Titan? As you said, it's in range of your home staging. If you get a Titan tackled, like, are you just not going to back phone your coalition brothers to come and save it? Like, I feel like there's really nothing probably can do to fight against the supers. Legacy has already said that everything that we do offensively in Providence is kind of on our own because we oh. make that decision to go on an offense. So like you know I, I've I've mentioned in in tests like or in in our fleet chats and stuff like that I'm like hey you know any FC's board there's a timer here and usually the response is sorry you know we're not going to get involved in something you've started in in Providence and that's fine like we go in knowing that um, so it's it's all about situation as well so for example yesterday they were shooting out for a, for a TCU attack timer they decided to bring their Macarial fleet which is not exactly maneuverable put it on our Fortizar grid, shooting our jump bridge. So at seven o'clock in the morning, when we had pretty much no one around outside of like a handful of people, we dropped a Titan on a Fortizar grid and dooms and boasted them because they couldn't cap escalate on that grid. So it's it's a combination of them making bad decisions and us just having the, the, the tactical advantage in that situation to be able to go, okay, we can probably get away with this, even though it's the worst time zone for us to do. So okay. we know they had like 20 dreads in range, but with what we had ready and the addition of the Fortas are on the grid, there was just no real way for them to counter it. They put themselves in that position, which ended up getting. And you don't even want Providence, do you? No. Like, I mean, <laughs> it's a joke. Like, the funny thing is we have this system and like uh, it, it started out as one, one or two of my guys, like this is probably a year ago now being like, you know what, Provi's in range of us. Let's just go farm them for content. And I said, go for it. So they dropped an Astro house. We killed a cap fleet on it. We're like, you know what, this is actually worth our time. So we put a bit more effort into it in this one system. And that's, it's all centered around this one system now so far. Like, don't get me wrong. We've de- we've definitely done stuff outside of this system, but most of that was just like we got bat phoned. You know, people ask for help, so we go outside of there. But as far as like offensive ops go, it's all central. Like it's all in one spot that happens to be in range of us. But that that's it. You know, we we don't, I could care less. Like if we lost the system, I'd be like, you know what, it was worth it. That's a shame, but that'd be it. that'd be the end of it. I wouldn't be like this is this is the end of probably and like go on a crusade or anything like that. I'd be like, all right, cool, let's find somewhere else to do something. Well, so. Uh, it- that kind of goes to like your job though right like uh you know as exec i mean you are you know the content creator right for your people and you know keeping them occupied and and doing stuff and causing you know these little fights and stuff i mean i'm i'm imagining that morale's pretty high you guys are kind of a a tight group yeah, well, I mean, so Tickle Tickle started actually three years ago today now. Today is the actual birthday of the, well, of the Corp. The Alliance is a couple of days younger, but... Dude, um, so three years happy ago birthday. Oh, shut up. <laughs> That's not even funny. I walked into that one head fucking first. I'm sorry. That was, anyway, that was low. So I'm sorry. The, the, the corp started like three years ago as me shooting off from goons because I got a little, I mean, I don't know, I had different, I wanted to do new things and things weren't really working for me in goons at the time. So I, 
you know, shot off. I did my own thing. And then I had about 20 ish people for who were all Australian follow me from goons join my group. So we're still, we're like, we got that really tight core group. And then that's sort of built from there. And, you know, more people that we knew joined and it's, it's, it's grown from that sort of initial core group. So, you know, the majority of the people who make the decisions, who get all the, you know, I wouldn't say get all the work done, but who make, you know, all the moving parts work, they, um, they, we all know each other in real life. Like I've met probably, I'd say I, I know everyone of that original core group, but I probably met like a good 75% of the active Australians in Tickle that I could like in person. I've met them somewhere. Uh, so, you know, we all know each other. It's it's a really tight group and our morale is definitely high because even if we, you know, feed them a little bit here and there, it's still hilarious because we, we, we simply can't get over the fact that they keep throwing stuff at us in this one system when they could just leave it and it really not change their lives in any way. The reason we're more active is because they're here giving us the content. So it's, it's but that's providence. I mean, we, we went in sort of knowing this thing that, you know, they're going to do that holy war stuff to get their land back. And they even said that on Reddit. And we're like, okay, cool. Why not? I mean, the, 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 to give you an example of, of how far they take it, there is one guy in Provi who we've killed 21 times in an Intosa ship because he's come and tried to Intosa their iHub in like a random time zone, and we just take the jump bridge and kill him. So 21 times for one guy. It, it's, it's incredible that they still keep trying. But it's not love Lumio, it. is it? No, no, it's some guy called oh. Siren Dark. Oh, okay. He's just, he bring it started with like industrials and frigates, and it's moved up to cruisers and battle cruisers. It's just, I mean, Props to the guy because he's dedicated, but at the same time, uh, the reason we kill him so much is because we know his patterns. So you can't argue with that. You, you just take the content. So this um, this mindset of we're just going to do something random until we get content and have fun doing it, is that sort of what you split off from Goons to do? Is this more of a, a typical, like, this is just how content works in the AUTZ? Like, how does your particular brand of finding content and playing EVE Online, how does that relate to the other groups in your time zone? Is it a time zone specific thing or is it just what you guys enjoy doing most? So it it started out as like a an AU time zone thing because so without getting like too backstory, I guess, it's it was a matter of it was we were an AU time zone group within Goons as it was, being told what to do by an EU slash US time zone leadership, which was kind of annoying because it's very easy to sit back and be like, but this is how things are in our time zone when the time zones are literally, like CCP released the numbers, Australian time zone counts for two, well, sorry, specifically Australia counts for 2% of the like population of the game. So when you think about how many people are actually in our time zone, it's much less than every other time zone. We do cross over with like the Russians and the Chinese, but that's less reliable because we're looking at, you know, a time, a time, period of time that is, I think our prime time probably starts like 07, 0800 Eve time and goes to maybe 12, 1300. That's roughly when we play. Pretty much no one else logs into those times unless they're ratting or they're mining or they're a very, very specific group that has that time zone, which is, and there's not a lot of them. So when we started this, it was a matter of let's make a home that was for Aussies run by Aussies who know what the, the time zone runs like and it needs. So part of that has come into a fact that we work with people from all sorts of groups. So like we work with guys in NC dot whenever we need to, because we know them. We work with guys in PL because we know them. We work with people in GOTG sometimes because we know them. You know, we work with people in, in many other groups like goons because we know them. So it's, it's a matter of, yes, we have our, our like large scale alliance leaderships, uh, sorry, uh, allegiances, but there is also the, the sort of internal time zone allegiance between people. That's like, you know what, when this leads to fun for all of us involved, let's get, let's do it. So it, it very much links to why we sort of have this attitude of we're happy to shoot you. And then the next day jump to a signer with all our caps because you've asked us to, because we trust you. So it's it's a very different dynamic. And I think sometimes a lot of other time zones get confused by that. Like one day we're shooting each other, the next we're working with each other. It's it's very confusing to the outside looking in because they don't know the, all the backstory. It's interesting you mentioned uh, the Chinese and Russian time zones because where you are like on, on the map, you're very close to where Fraternity lives. Fraternity being, as far as I know, the largest Chinese group in the game. So if I didn't know anything about this Providence campaign, if you guys hadn't posted the propaganda to Reddit, I would have just assumed that what you guys do for content is go go and farm fraternity. But is that does that happen? Do you guys is there that overlap where you can get some good fights out of them? Or is the time zone too separated? Like what's the deal there? So it's it's close enough that we can, but what's happened over time is so Tickle is about, I think, a thousand characters, roughly. And I think in an EU time zone, that's probably 
probably 60 to 75 percent of that thousand is au time zone or at least logs into the au time zone out of that there's probably maybe 80 to 120 ish real people now the problem with fraternity is they can they cross over into our time zone but they're a significantly larger group and they've 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 basically bulked up since we first encountered them. We used to be able to take them sort of one-on-one -on -one tickle versus fraternity because we'd leverage better ships and better doctrines and stuff like that versus their extreme numbers. Like we would fight two to three times outnumbered and we'd still come out ahead because we were using better stuff. The issue is they've hit that point now where they've they've got all those numbers have now gotten to the same level as us. So fighting them one-on-one -on -one has become very difficult because they're just simply too big and too strong now. Like we can't leverage what we used to. So the ability to get regular content out of them is a lot more difficult than it used to be. They've also encountered the fact that they used to set their solve and their timers for our primary time zone. Like they'd set a smack bang 0900, which is like when we log in basically and primarily. Then we started attacking them, we started poking them. So they just said, fuck it. They shifted everything to like 11, 1200, which is, it's doable, but it's on the far end of our time zone. So on a weekday, if we're like, hey, we've got a timer at 1130, we just don't have the people that are able to stay up like assuming the timer takes an hour and a half, that pushes things into sort of midnight territory on a weeknight. It's just not viable on a larger scale. So I'd love to fight fraternity, but unfortunately a combination of them shifting their time zone forward from us and them also having the larger numbers, it, it's not as viable as, as it used to be. Look, we still hunt them and we still like shoot their, you know, their rockles and their, their supers and stuff like that. We've got a couple of guys who are really dedicated to hunting that kind of stuff, but in terms of regular content where we can actually go out and have like fleet fights and stuff like that, it's just not as viable because we just like get zerged basically. And uh, part of, I think as well, um, our, our perspective is we, we, when I started this, I tried to go into a location in a situation where we didn't need to be a part of a big block. I was like, you know, let's try and do our own thing and just sort of play, play the sides as best we can. And, you know, be that neutral guy who doesn't poke the bear too much and doesn't sort of roll over too much either. And we did that uh, very well for a while by punching well above our weight. As time ground down and things happened, you know, people started to get more bat phones and, and that's one of those things, you know, you can, you can fight really well, when you have a better like time zone um, dominance than others, but once they start to bat phone everyone and they you know each group brings twenty and they bring fifty and they bring twenty, you know it all adds up and it becomes very very difficult to start taking on larger and larger group. And I mean that's pretty standard across the time zone. So across any time zone, sorry. So for AU, you know there there is probably a lot more content that we could get, but it was a trade off between if we wanted to maintain our 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 presence in Nullsec, we kind of had to join a block and it was something that we sort of accepted and that 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 meant you know we we had to lose certain uh, you know uh, access to certain has tickle ever deployed anywhere or are you guys kind of stick so we we've deployed a couple of times primarily we've deployed against fraternity that those those were our biggest deployments and those were our most successful ones we recently did deploy north with the um the test deployment to region and we were there and we did so, sort of some stuff in au time zone unfortunately just that location was so primarily horde doesn't have a huge au like they do have some but it wasn't very active when we were there and they weren't actually in Gemini at the time once we undeployed, they obviously moved back to Gemini. But, <laughs> of course, that's yeah, what yeah, they typically. always do. Yeah. But um, we found most of our content in GOTG space, which was a good 20 to 25 jumps up to 30 jumps away, which was kind of making it very, I don't know, it, it was a very difficult deployment to sort of balance because we wanted to be there to help test, but at the same time, our content was further away. So we did what we could, but yeah, th those deployments haven't gone amazingly well. Like our best, like I said, our best deployments were definitely fraternity. But generally speaking, with the fact that frat is relatively close and the fact that provi is i mean just coming to our doorstep we haven't needed to deploy a ton in fact whilst we were on deployment we got more content out of provi than we did every out of everyone in the north because provi decided to push and shoot our four desire and try and take our eye hub because we were deployed. you know on the kind of the fraternity topic you know when we were fighting them you know i had you know nothing but respect for them because they just kept on coming and they were coming and they were making really bad decisions and they were dying a lot, but they kept on coming and they kept on forming. And, you know, that kind of, you know, just drive, like, you know, you just, you will get better. 
you know, because we, you know, test, right? Like we were like that years ago. You just continue and continue. You will slowly get better. You, you know, so I've always thought, you know, that when uh, we had our uh, NIP with them and they kind of went there, went away that, you know, if they kept at it and they kept doing it and they kept doing their thing, like they would slowly start to be, you know, someone that, you know, we're going to have to hunt down and kill one day. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like fighting them in AU time zone, I was, I, we would be on grid and we'd, we would, you know, we would rinse them. We would like, for example, and without sounding too, like, I guess, arrogant about it, but we, we would take like a, you know, a 60 man rattlesnake fleet with like triage and fight a 150, 200 man Tempest fleet, lose not a single rattlesnake and wipe like half their Tempest. And that was that was a combination of just pilot skill. Like their skill points were very very low at the time. Their fleet comps were not very uniform, and their FCs were still very new. And you know we'd wipe the floor with them, and everyone would be running around high fiving, being like, "Yeah, yeah, we did really well." But I was sitting back there going, "You know, a year from now, this yep. is going to be very." Like, That's I'm exactly. Really mm -hmm. So you know, it, it was it was really good to like farm them and and like use use it. But their FCs would literally message me and be like, "Thank you for bringing these fights. We need to learn and get better." And I'm like, "Please don't," because you know, I, I it was it was going to be Please impossible don't. for us to yeah, like we we as an alliance at like a maxed form, we were like forming every dread we could. And even whilst they were um they were still like really low you know sp low isk and all that kind of stuff they were still matching us almost on dreads and again it was a matter of like skill and um just better fits and uniform doctrine that we would win those fights but it was getting to that point even then where it was like this is getting really really dodgy like we may not be able to do this for much longer and sure enough like eight months later or whatever and you know ualx fights and stuff like that you know they're putting massive amounts of titans and supers on field massive amounts of tempest out like you said you know dying by the hundreds and stuff like that, but coming back, it's that right. ability for them to just keep bringing people that that you need know, just wear out. You can't compete with that after a while. Wow. They I mean, don't have a chip in the game in Probably, right? Or they? Um, I don't. Uh, I haven't really seen them. I I okay. think that it's something that we could potentially see in the right situation. You know, mm -hmm. if if a super fleet was tackled or something like that, and it was like, like for example, our supers jumped in and they were sort of in that point where they couldn't really break us, but we couldn't really break free. I think we could expect to see fraternity turn up just like, because they, they would. But um, in terms of uh, every day to day stuff, I haven't seen them yet, but I'm wary enough that they may be around. I know that fraternity have hunted HTP and stuff like that. And obviously we work with HTP sometimes, so there could be some crossover there, but as a general, you know, what's going on, I don't really see them. I think they're sort of off doing their own thing at the moment. You know, do you have any insight over the past couple of days? Because I know that you're right around this area, but I think Evictus has lost two supers. I think one was to a PL Dread Bomb, um, which, you know, was surprising. But um, that, did, have you been around for that? Or are, are PL like kind of, you know, staged right off the side there? I haven't really been around, but from my understanding of the geography I th and what I've seen, I think they're guys that live slash have jump clones in Doral and that general area because that has range. Oh, and that makes sense. I think, it was, I think it was a simple farmer's guys hunting Evictus and then calling those PL dudes because they're relatively close. Like they have some decent, again, like those simple farmer's guys are 95% AU time. Like I know all of them. Um <laughs> Well, like, not all of them, sorry, sorry. I've I've met like three of them and there's only about fifteen of them. So I know a lot of them and a few of my guys actually know them as well. So um we know them reasonably well as to how they act and what they're gonna do and stuff like that. And it's part of the reason they stay away from us as well, because we will hunt them because you know, you gotta hunt your friends more than anyone. But um and and I think simple farmers, I think Brave has now killed 200 of their structures and they're still dropping like uh, <laughs> they, I mean, on, that, on that structure spam on a different level. Coming, yeah, they've got 100 Citadels coming out on Christmas Day, apparently. Yeah, it's worth noting that because there was a post, I think it was the first post that I saw on this whole campaign that, or quotes, campaign that you guys have in Probi is that HTP dropped something like 30 structures around probably various staging areas, 9UI, etc. Is that like, is that fake news? Like, what is the deal? Is this, some, what is the deal with structure spam? It's, it's, and it's, it's generic Christmas stuff. Like, genuinely, whenever there's like 
and this is the best word to use it, insidious people that you want to like remove from your space, they Christmas tank everything. So they'll just go ahead and drop 50 plus, like as many citadels they can simply get down because it's the best time of the year to try and get like as many troll citadels up as you can. Because once they're down, they're so much easier to defend. Well, not easier, but they're more annoying to, which is what yep. they aim for. So, you know, it, it's, it's, un, it's, not, uh, it's not surprising. I, I, I expected something like this to happen. Simple farmers, we sort of had bets on how many they would drop. We said probably like 50 plus. So I guess, you know, a hundred is pretty, but um, I, it wouldn't surprise me if a bunch go up in Delve over the next, well, over, probably over the last couple of days, there would be probably a bunch going in Delve. That usually happens as well. Cause you know, fuck goons basically. Yeah. It's pretty generic. It, it happens nearly every year. Like one year it was post towers. The next it was citadels. It's pretty, well, and that big fight that we just had Monday, that final timer is on Christmas Day, and then we have another timer the next day. Uh, so it, now it's, you know, hey, are we bigger losers <laughs> and going to show up to this timer, or are they going to show up and are we just going to make fun of each other, or like how's you're, that fight going to happen? You're right? going about <laughs> this wrong. you got to get the family in, have a LAN party, get them their own PC, and set them up on another's account. Like, come on now. Just don't tell CCP account sharing <laughs> isn't allowed, but if you do it on the quiet, leverage your family connections. Leverage your social life to your advantage. That's how we do it. Well, I mean, I'm just saying I know a lot of the test people. We're going to form hard on Christmas Day. There's a lot of people ain't got shit to do. (laughs) So we're going to be there. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, the same uh, with this little conflict, too. People are like, well, I'll be home from whatever I was doing by 8 p.m. local. I can play Eve for five hours after that. Don't don't tell me I can't go to a timer, you know. I mean, you know, that is one of those. Uh, Eve is one of those very few games, though, that instills that kind of that dedication in people. It's dedication or desperation.